Hey, this is Justin from Ecclesia, and we are continuing to walk through the first letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the disciple Timothy. Uh, we talked a little bit last week about Timothy's upbringing, how he was raised in the scriptures and by his mom and his grandma, and how at some point in time he heard and received by faith uh, the gospel of our Lord and our Savior Jesus. Now he's operating a ministry under the, uh, under the guidance of the Apostle Paul, and Paul's writing him to encourage him to make sure that all of his teaching uh, has the aim of producing love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And this week we're going to explore how the Apostle um, meets Timothy uh, in a place of um, misunderstanding concerning the usefulness of the law and ordinances. Now, I think it's important here that we differentiate between the law, that is to say, uh, Scripture proper, the Old Testament, and the law and ordinances. Um, we know that, the, that all Scripture from Genesis to Revelation is inspired by God. It's useful for teaching, for rebuke, for instruction, uh, for training and covenant faithfulness so that we can be equipped for every good work that God has for us to walk in. And uh, we also know that the testimony of Scripture uh, exists for us to look back and see how God has been faithful to humanity uh, through since the beginning. And so, uh, so the Apostle Paul writes to the disciple Timothy, We know, after all, that the law is good, if someone uses it lawfully. We recognize that the law is not laid down for people who are in the right, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the godless and sinners, the unholy and worldly, for people who kill their father or mother, for murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and those who practice any other behavior contrary to healthy teaching, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of God, the Blessed One, that was entrusted to me. So, immediately the Apostle Paul wants to affirm Timothy's passion for the law and ordinances. He was raised in this, um, he, uh, he felt very strongly about this, as, as well as the Apostle Paul. And, uh, and, but we know that Paul came to a, a tremendous awakening, awakening or revelation when he experienced uh, the presence and the power of the risen Christ. And so he's coming alongside the, the disciple Timothy and he's agreeing with him that the law and ordinances is actually a good thing if someone uses it lawfully. Now we know from all the court cases and everything that happened here in America that there are many times where injustices happen because laws are misused and abused a lot of times because they're taken out of context or a law that was issued a long time ago for a specific uh, purpose was then uh, applied to a situation that really didn't make sense but based on the letter of the law they were able to make it apply someone was being selfish someone wanted to get their own way and so they pushed something uh, onto that the, the law was taken out of context and the law was misused but if the law is used properly it's actually a good thing um, it says we recognize that the law is not laid down for people who are in the right but for the lawless and disobedient for the godless and sinners, the unholy and worldly, for people who kill their father or mother, for murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and those who practice any other behavior contrary to healthy teaching. So let's talk about the chosen people of God for a minute. The, the Israelites, the Hebrew people, were in slavery for 400 years. God led them out of slavery by a mighty act of power and they eventually found themselves at the foot of Mount Sinai having walked through the deliverance that they received um, from the angel of death through the blood of the lamb that was shed for them uh, through the waters of the Red Sea which cut off the Egyptians that were trying to drag them back into slavery and now they're at the foot of Mount Sinai to learn what it means to be God's people. But they have been without um, this kind of guidance and without this kind of freedom for such a long period of time. Uh, I've heard it said that it's, it's a lot easier to get uh, people out of Egypt than to get Egypt out of people. And so they had to learn afresh what it meant to be truly human. 
So Moses ascends Mount Sinai and spends time face to face with God receiving the Ten Commandments. But then God comes down Mount Sinai only to find this people that God had just delivered from slavery uh, worshiping idols. Um, and so he breaks those tablets, intercedes for the people, ascends the mountain again, and receives the Torah or receives the, the, the Ten Commandments uh, again and comes down and begins to lead the people. Now the law and ordinances goes from being ten commandments to 613 commandments that are in the Old Testament scriptures. Now again the point of these laws is that there were transgressions of these laws. There were situations that occurred where people did things uh, that were contrary to, um, to God's will. And we know that from the prophet Isaiah that it says they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So when the knowledge of God fills the land, then there is no hurting or destroying one another in these sorts of things. But because God is patient and because God does not insist on his own way and we can choose to uh, resist the Holy Spirit, we can choose to reject the words of God and do our own thing to our own destruction and to our own folly. But nevertheless, because God is love, he never insists on his own way. Rather, he draws us by his spirit. He draws us by his love. And so the law is given to them in order for them to learn how not to be lawless and um, and I think that's really important because um, because the law and ordinances is something that we can learn a lot from when we sit at the feet of our father and he gives us instruction um, it is a good thing uh, our father's instruction is a glorious thing so why do Christians celebrate not being under the law, but rather being in Christ and led forth and ministered to by grace alone? The law and ordinances is something that we in and of ourselves fail at consistently. And the way that the law works is that if you violate the law, there exists a law of sin and death. If you transgress the law at any point, then you're guilty of the whole law and the penalty is death. And so because of that, we praise God that we have received the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ who died for our sins and delivered us from the slavery of the law and delivered us from the law of sin and death into a place of blessedness, a place of being filled with and led by the Spirit of God's only Son, who was the only sinless one who never transgressed the law in any capacity. And so, so it's good to recognize that the law exists for people who are not in the right. We find ourselves in the right, though, not based on our performance of the law, but we find ourselves in the right because the covenant faithfulness demonstrated by Jesus in his walk as he was um, as he ministered here on earth that righteousness or that covenant faithfulness is imputed to us as we are in him and he is in us and this is a gloriously good thing this is a this is a powerful truth and so he says um, so what are some of these things that caused the law to be necessary? Uh, the law being added 400 years after the promises were given to Abram. So if the promises come by faith, um, that occurred to Abram 400 years before the law and ordinance was given. And so that's, um, that's an important thing to note. He says that the law is actually issued because there was lawlessness. There were there was disobedience to God. There was worldliness. That is to say, uh, people's desires uh, were not from heaven, but it was earthly and demonic. Uh, for people who kill their father or mother for murders, to, to take another life is like in, in the Judeo-Christian ethic, to take another life is essentially like destroying a universe. 
um, human life is extremely, extremely valuable uh, within the Judeo-Christian mindset. For fornicators, we see the destruction happening all over our nation. Not only all of the abortions occurring, but all of the broken hearts and broken families and broken relationships because of the lack of self-control in our culture um, to say, you know what, to actually engage in sexual uh, relationship with someone uh, prior to actually having a covenant commitment and a genuine uh, self-giving enduring love for one another it creates all sorts of havoc so it really has nothing to do with God wanting to be some sort of a uh, a killjoy it has um, it has everything uh, to do with God's concern for our well-being our spirit our soul and our body um, he says uh, sodomites here we see if you go back to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah the um, the idea of, of rape um, the idea of raping uh, men raping men and um, the complete lack of hospitality um, the misuse uh, of, of sexuality um, just it was a horrible horrible thing and it was completely misguided what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah and so people who commit to the, that sort of a lifestyle or that sort of mentality um, there is a, this is why the law exists slave traders to actually enslave another human being and to trade people um, this is abhorrent this is terrible in God's sight liars um, people who you know misrepresent the truth or tell half truths in order to attain to selfish gain this um, just not the way humanity was meant to be perjurers those who actually bring other people before a court of law in order to uh, for their own selfish reasons and then present lies and half truths and and in order to in order to again attain personal gain uh, selfishness and it's it's destructive they don't understand that they they destroy their own lives by doing that and those who practice any other behavior contrary to healthy teaching um, and so as we open the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation and we explore healthy teaching and those who have actually been obedient to God's Word and how their lives uh, became fruitful uh, in ways that surpassed even their own lifetimes and went on even speaking by faith uh, beyond the grave which is amazing um, and then it goes on to say, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of God. Okay, in accordance with the gospel of the good, in the good news of the glory of God. Well, we as the church, um, we are the glory of our of our bridegroom. And so, when we talk about the people of God being a peculiar people, a people that are set apart, a people who live their lives according to the spirit of God being filled with and guided by the grace of God uh, through the faithfulness of Jesus when we talk about that we talk about actually receiving the blessed one and caring for the blessed one and walking in God's spirit it's um, all this healthy teaching stems from that if we want to actually have a love that issues from a pure heart a good conscience and a sincere faith Jesus says I am the way the truth and the life nobody comes to the Father except through me so what Jesus is saying is that this divine love it cannot be attained to it cannot be arrived at in any other way than the way the truth and the life that is Jesus and so when he calls us to come and follow him it is for our good he wants to lead us to a place of holiness a place of divine love and divine fruitfulness a place of knowing the living God of knowing this love of embracing this love and of existing in this love for all of eternity and we have the down payment on that in the Holy Spirit so if you find yourself in a place where you've yet to truly place your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior I encourage you turn towards God be baptized into Christ and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. May God bless you and keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you. May He 
be gracious to you and lift his countenance, his countenance up towards you and give you true shalom. Amen.